Universities and cops across the country are responding to peaceful student protests with violence. Now, this may come as a shock, but it's not the first time that America has cracked down on peaceful student protesters. But before we break that down, we have to talk about what's happening right now. Student protesters are witnessing their university administrations collude with local and state police against them. It's happening everywhere, from elite private institutions like Columbia University in New York City to renowned state schools like the University of Texas in Austin and the University of Michigan, resulting in levels of violence and restrictions on free speech on college campuses that we haven't seen in decades. But how could this be? Isn't this America where we pride ourselves on our First Amendment rights? Would you be surprised if I told you that college campuses in the U.S. have a long history of being hubs for student protests as well as violent state repression? Kind of the exact opposite of what they're supposed to be, right? To understand that history and how it's influencing the pro-Palestine protests that we're seeing on college campuses today, I came here to UC Berkeley where student protesters have set up their own Gaza Solidarity encampment. It was inspired by our brave students over at Columbia who we consider to be the heart of the student movement, but more importantly, we're standing in solidarity with our people in Palestine. This is a historic moment. I mean, we were the first California institution and the first UC um, to put up a solidarity encampment. Um, and I never thought as a Palestinian student that within my lifetime and as a student would be, I'd be able to witness something like this. Berkeley has a deep rooted history in student led protests in all kinds of movements from free speech and anti-war protests in the 60s to anti-apartheid protests in the 80s, all the way up until today, where students at the university are protesting for an end to the genocide in Gaza and for their university to divest from corporations that profit off of Israeli apartheid. We're here to amplify our four main demands. One, being that the UC administration end their silence and categorize this as a genocide. Two, demanding utter and complete UC financial divestment from any entity complicit in apartheid, especially contracts with weapons arms manufacturer companies. Three, to demand an academic boycott, so the severing of all ties with quote-unquote Israeli institutions um, that were built on stolen land. And four, end the repression. Hands off our students and hands off Palestine. This plaza has actually been the site of a lot of Berkeley's most iconic protests throughout the decades. Protests that helped spark other anti-war movements on college campuses and cities across the country in the late 60s and early 70s. In fact, Berkeley became so synonymous with student protest and 1960s counterculture that it drew the ire of one very famous supervillain. Sorry, I mean politician. Trigger warning. It's Sorry, is my mic working? I said Basically, Ronald Reagan hated Berkeley and the progressive values it represented. And Reagan was running for governor in 1966, at a time when anti-Vietnam War protests in the U.S. were still relatively small, and protesters at Berkeley represented a minority in public opinion. So, in order to capitalize on public perceptions of Berkeley students as deviant hippies, anarchists, and sleeper communists, Reagan launched a targeted smear campaign against Berkeley students and faculty. Sound familiar? Anyway, in 1969, Reagan's hostility towards Berkeley came to a head when he sent police and later the National Guard to attack protesters at People's Park, just a few blocks from here. Students on campus were tear gassed from helicopters, one person was killed, and dozens others were injured. It came to be known as Bloody Thursday, and it helped set the precedent for state and local violence against student protesters. And just one year later, the Ohio National Guard was called on anti-war student protesters at Kent State University, which led to the infamous Kent State Massacre, where four unarmed college students were killed and nine others were injured. Which brings us to today, where local and state police are violently attacking and arresting student protesters simply for exercising their right to free speech. It's incredibly sickening and it's disgusting, the reaction of the administration and law enforcement, but it's not shocking. I think that these instances um, symbolize the greater parallels of militarization um, and violence that is inflicted by the Zionist regime. We see this where Palestinians on the ground are being bulldozed um, and killed and displaced and shot at, and yet they are painted as the aggressor, while Zionist militias with some of the most advanced technology systems in the world are still painted as the victim. And that's exactly what's happening here in the U.S. on a domestic scale. And because these students are directly challenging the status quo in this country, they're being vilified by the media and by politicians on both sides of the aisle. And despite our country's dark history of military intervention on college campuses, Politicians today are calling for the National Guard to be deployed against students in 2024, something that should make everyone very worried. 
The reaction and the demonization of pro-Palestinian protesters is not new, but it simply points to how scared these institutions are and how they know that we as protesters are standing on the side of justice um, and they're willing to engage in any violent narratives and demonize us and any tactics possible to silence us. If we continue down this path, it's only a matter of time before things take a much, much darker turn. And if history's taught us anything, it's that students protesting war, violence, and apartheid are usually on the right side of history. So we should probably listen to them, not try and shut them down. Um, we're willing to risk suspension, expulsion, arrest by any and anything possible to achieve our goal of divestment. And we will continue to do that just like other students across the nation are doing. For more news on Palestine that doesn't suck, follow Mondeweiss.